Welcome everybody to another episode of Dr. Matt and Dr. Mike's Medical Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Todorovic. I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Matthew James Lorraine Franklin Barton. Got them all. Got them all Got in there. Oh, good. How are you? You could just use an initialism. What would that going be? Going forward. Oh, I don't know. R A A S. R A A S. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. What's that stand for? Uh, Renan. Yeah. Angiotensin. Right. Is it angiotensin or tensinogen? Nope. Renan angiotensin. Aldosterone. Right. Server. No system. <laughs> okay, so bad start to the podcast. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, today we're talking about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, and it's going to be a whirlwind ride because it is one of my favorite systems of the body. There's obviously many. Uh, and it's an important system because many... So it's not a body system. What do you mean? It's not like the gastrointestinal system or the uh, gotcha. the renal system. It's not an organ system. <laughs> yeah. No, you're right. It, it is not. It is a uh, biochemical system. And it... Let's just, let's just jump straight into it. What a do you pathway. Think? It is a pathway. Yeah. It's a pathway that basically regulates our blood pressure and our blood volume. And that's really important because we know that a good percentage of people around the world have elevated blood pressure and blood volume issues well uh they sort of go hand in hand in which you can help correct the blood pressure issue by correcting blood volume and so a lot of people tend to have drugs that intersect or stop or play around with one or multiple aspects of this pathway that's the other great thing is that because it's a pathway and there's many steps to it, there's many medications that have been made that affect different parts and different components. Which we'll discuss today. Which we'll discuss because if you think about it, when you learn uh, nursing, medicine, whatever it may be, some sort of health science, and you start learning pharmacology, pathophysiology, f- just physiology, uh, you start to go, oh, okay, there's all these patients with high blood pressure or they've got fluid balance issues and they're on these drugs. What do these drugs do? Oh, they all fit in this one pathway. And if you know the pathway, you understand the drugs, beautiful. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do today. So the renin angiotensin aldosterone system... Uh, is so is a system that uh, puts together a number of organ systems? Like it does. Interconnects them? There's another bo- number of organs involved in this pathway and there's another a number of but what i mean is it like it plays an important role for the cardiovascular system yes it plays an important role for the renal system yep and i guess vascular system but that's part of the lungs as well when we get to a certain part so it's actually multi-organ yeah correct but we're going to we're going to focus predominantly on its role for cardiovascular and renal uh and it's a system that originates at the kidneys so without the kidneys this system's not happening. and However, what I will push back a little bit on this. Go on. Uh, I've come across a, a little bit of literature that has um, put into contest that it is a, a system that is systemic. Excuse me, mate. So we are taught this system, this uh, pathway, this... Uh, what was the other thing I used? Other term I used? No idea. I wasn't paying attention. Okay. Sorry, man. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, that is, it happens systemically. So it happens within the whole body. Right. As it, opposed to... Even like even though you said like a big part of it is started off by the kidney, then the lungs come in and then it affects these discrete locations. But it happens as a whole system, right? Yep. There is now suggestion that this pathway can happen in tissue as well. Localised. So independently of this systemic uh, pathway that we're talking about today. Yeah, so what they've done is they've now classified it into classical RAS and yeah. non-classical RAS right. or traditional, non-traditional. But So w- what they're showing is that... So we're going to be talking predominantly about the classical RAS system and its involvement in blood pressure, blood volume. But there are non-classical RAS systems which tend to be more localised at tissue levels that have effects when it comes to things like... Blood pressure, hy- hy- hypertension. Well, not, ne- not, not just that. Like there, there's... Um, um, when heart it comes failure. To, yeah, when it comes to the heart itself, um, altering the heart structure itself. 
Yes. When it comes to um, even uh, diabetes and obesity tissues, it can promote fibrosis. Yes. You know, it, yes. so there's a multitude of of uh, tissues that it can affect in different ways. It can promote inflammation, right? So, so I'll give you an example on that, and this is why I kind of brought it up at this point. But we'll come back to it. You you may have some individuals, let's say. Um, a particular racial background that may have a predisposition to hypertension. And we'll, in the hypertension, we'll, the, the, the type that we'll use here is primary hypertension or essential hypertension, which is what, 97, is it 97? 95%? Yeah, close to 95%. 95% of all the hypertension, this just means high blood pressure. Um, people with high, high blood pressure are sitting in the primary or essential category, yeah. which kind of means we don't know what's the cause of it, right? Yes. But there are some people who are more predisposed to getting primary hypertension. And so if you were to look at them, so you know they have hypertension, but then you try to investigate through the RAS pathway and say, all right, well, let's see if they've got high levels of renin or let's have a look if they've got high levels of angiotensin II, which are powerful um, products of producing uh, vasoconstriction and high blood pressure, right? But they may not have that, right? And so if you were to try to manipulate those parameters that would typically increase blood pressure, they fit within a normal range. But then when you say bring a, a medication in, then the medication seems to have a profound effect. But it could be because this RAS pathway is only happening within the tissue of their kidney. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what happens outside the body is kind of irrelevant, but they've still got high, high blood pressure. But it's only when you have an effect on the RAS pathway, but only within the kidney. It's mediated at the, the local level, not at the systemic right. level. Okay, right. let's let's zoom back out again and let's talk about, firstly, uh, what this system is, because we haven't really spoken about any of that, um, why we have it, and then let's just quickly go through the pathway and then we'll dissect and break up each different aspect of the pathway. Okay, Sounds So good. the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, you can tell by its name... It has renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone, and it's a system. So obviously, it's going to involve multiple ch- tissues, and there's going to be other uh, various chemicals and cofactors and substrates coming in and playing an important role. Its whole purpose is to maintain adequate blood pressure and blood volume. In actual fact, its purpose is to respond to decreases or drops in blood pressure and blood volume to boost blood pressure and blood volume back up. Yep. And, and this whole system... Be- so, so it mean doesn't really have a primary function in salt balance. That's just secondary to blood volume. Well, we'll get to that. body fluid volume. I'll answer that question by asking you a question, right? right? So this renin angiotensin aldosterone system starts with renin. That's the very first thing that's going to be released. And the kidneys release it, which tells you that the rate-limiting factor of maintaining blood pressure and blood volume starts at the kidneys. So why, Matt, would our kidneys be in control of regulating our blood pressure? Why wouldn't it be our heart, for example, that produces our blood pressure? It's true. Um, Well, maybe you could make arguments that other factors are coming into play. Just answer my question. No, 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 no. no. Pull that out. Let's just say we've now given our kidneys the control over long-term blood pressure management, which is exactly what Only this is. Only blood pressure or blood pressure, blood volume? Yep, both. Okay. Why? Why would this be an important role for the kidneys well, to control? Well, the kidneys as an organ, one of its primary functions is to uh, filter our blood um, and it, for it to do the filtering, it's a... Um, yeah, I mean, like it's a it's a sieve that has to push fluid through it, um, the fluid from our blood through it, and so for that sieve to work, it needs to have a certain degree of pressure, and if they haven't got that pressure, it can't push the fluid through the sieve, therefore it can't filter the blood, therefore there's no point of having kidneys. So the kidneys really have to ensure that they're getting a certain force of blood through it to make the kidneys job functional. Yeah. Therefore, it plays an important role in telling the body that it needs to have a pressure at a certain level. Yeah, so even though our kidneys are very small organs relative to other organs, they receive 20-25% of our cardiac output, so the amount of blood our heart pumps out every minute. And it needs to filter 
120 mils of blood every minute, and which means over the period of a day, it filters nearly 200 litres of blood. So it takes, it takes well, it basically filters more 200 than 200 litres of plasma. But it produces... Plasma or whole blood? I mean, it doesn't really filter the whole blood, but... No, but what it, it does is the blood that get the blood that goes to so the 200, kidneys... So 200 litres of blood. No, it produces 200 litres of filtrate. filtrate. Okay, so, so plasma. So of the blood that gets there, yep. of what can be filtered, yep. it like that sieve you were talking about of the kidneys. Which we call the glomerulus. Yep. yep. We push it through that glomerulus to filter stuff through. And on the other side of the glomerulus, that's called filtrate. It's okay. basically our pre-piss. It's pre-urine, right? So, oh, it's, so of it's, that filtrate, yeah. of that filtrate, we we make two hundred, nearly two hundred liters of that. It filtrate. actually looks like urine. It, well, basically, ends up being urine yeah. at the end of it, if you follow it down that tube. Because when I give blood, which is plasma, oh, you saying that plasma looks like urine? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which we, which would be filtrate, Makes basically. Total sense. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like they've just taken a bag of apple juice out of you. Right. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but not as delicious. I don't think it tastes like that though. Probably not. Uh, 800 mils of apple juice. Mm, mm. Yeah. Um, so your kidneys produce 200 litres, litres of filtrate. But if, like I said, if you followed that through all the tubes of the kidneys, uh, called the nephrons, all the way to the very end, that comes out your How urethra. long is a nephron? I don't know. How long is a nephron? We've got 2 million of them. Yeah. So anyway. 1 million each kidney. Yeah. Oh, so you don't know how long No, no. I, th- I thought you'd have that fact. Why would I have that fact? I have no idea how long a nephron is. They vary in length depending on which nephrons because some nephrons... Zach. <laughs> oh, very good, very good. All right. We don't pee out that 200 litres, which means... Luckily. Of that, that 200 litres of filtrate doesn't make it all the way to our urethra. Would you pee out that urination. much if you're a fish? No. Of course not. Otherwise, you... Deplete your entire body fluid what balance it, within half a day. What if you're a freshwater fish? No. I think you're urinating a lot though. I'm sure you are, but yeah. I don't think you are urinating the complete filtrate. And this is actually why we have this system. It's because when we um, left the oceans and we came onto land... For you, it was yeah. a lot more recent than... <laughs> most I think you're going to say out of the tree. But no, that's that's a compliment, out of the ocean. Yeah. Um, Mermaid Barton. So... <laughs> Um, no man, no man. Uh, so it's harder to regulate your fluid balance when you're on land compared to if you're in uh, a water body. That makes sense. So therefore, you need to have a, a system that tightly regulates. Yeah, it's amazing fluids how fluids and ca- blood volume. We come out of the ocean. We're still bags of fluid. I weigh seventy kilograms. So this is, you at the beach? This is this. <laughs> That's what my wife calls me when I'm just laying there in the sun. She goes, look at that bag of fluid. Uh, So as a 70 kilogram male, 42 litres of... So 42 kilograms of me is water. That's a lot for someone that walks on land and doesn't doesn't always have easy access to water, at least historically. So we need to figure out really good ways. And you have ways of losing water. So you could... Uh, vomit profusely or diarrhea profusely. Yep. So that's a lot of water gone. Yep. And so, and it will bleed out. So yep. you you have to have pretty stringent mechanisms on how to regulate this body fluid. fluid. And yes. this is essentially the basis of this system we're talking about today. Yeah, it really is. Uh, uh, and it's and it's important because if we go back to the original question I asked you, which is why would the kidneys be in control of blood pressure? Did I answer correctly? Y- you answered it um, adequately. How many marks would I get for... Uh, out of ten, a ten, a ten mark short answer question. One, one point seven five. That's a fail. That's a big. In fail. my eyes, you are. Yeah, in my eyes, you're a failure. So, what we have is that <coughs> of that two hundred liters, we don't of filtrate that we make from the blood every day. We don't pee the two hundred liters out, which means ninety nine percent of that two hundred liters gets reabsorbed back into the body. We throw it back into the body, and we only pee out one percent of that two hundred liters, which is two liters. So our urine output per day is around about two liters. So. Like you did say, the whole purpose of the kidneys is to filter the blood because the blood's going to be filled with all the byproduct metabolites from making energy, uh, building muscle tissue, all that type of stuff. It gets thrown into the blood, which then takes it to the kidneys. If the kidneys don't filter that out every day, they met- those metabolites build up and they become toxic. We die very quick. So the kidneys must receive that 120 milliliters of blood per minute. All the time, it must. 
regardless of what's happening. Oh, there's going to be a period. It's going to be periods where you, you know, if you have a serious fight and flight situation, you would not be making much of your own. Sure. Very transient though. But the point is that at the end, let's just say at the end of a 24 hour period, then you need to have filtered that 180 liters, 200 liters of blood. You need to. And if you haven't, then the kidneys haven't done their job. Toxic metabolites build up in the blood. You get sick and you die. So this is so. Even if let's just say your heart is not working very well and your blood pressure is really low, the kidney the, the kidneys don't care. Kidneys, are like, I still need to get the blood that I need. I need still need to get 120 mils per minute. So the kidneys must be in control of this to maintain adequate what we call perfusion. So that's why the kidneys regulate the very first rate limiting step of this renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Now, very quickly, this system begins with the kidneys releasing renin. Then the liver releases angiotensinogen. Renin chops angiotensinogen into something called angiotensin 1, which is floating through the bloodstream. The lungs and some other tissues release an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme, also known as ACE, to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And angiotensin 2 has a... There's a lot of stuff. A vast number of effects in the body, which ultimately at the end of the day, increase blood volume, increase blood pressure, and increase the kidney's abilities to filter. Okay. Right? Because at the end of the day, the kidneys don't care about the body's blood pressure. It cares about its own blood pressure. But it does it by systemically increasing blood pressure and blood volume but also locally affecting its ability to increase filtration. Yes, right? yes. But, but all it cares about is its own filtration. It doesn't care so you, about what the you're, What effects. you're trying to say here is the kidneys are selfish. Yes. I thought... Not shellfish. I thought they... Shellfish. <laughs> shellfish. <laughs> Enough of the ocean, Michael. <laughs> I thought that they weren't, you know. I thought they were here for us. Really? Yeah. You thought they were an altruistic organ? Yes, yeah, that's right. No. Like the liver. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. The liver is quite good. It is... The best. It's the best example. And people damage it with alcohol. <laughs> Can you believe? They, they reward it by uh, drinking whiskey. Metabolize this. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to make a t-shirt that says metabolize Metabolize this. 10 of these <laughs> in, a, in an hour. All right. Shall we begin at step one? At the release of renin at the kidneys. Now, what could be some possible triggers to begin this RAS? So, uh, this RAS pathway. What could uh, be the ve- like? We know that. Well, should we say where renin gets released from first? Um, yeah, yeah. We probably need to create a an anatomical picture of what people should be imagining while we're discussing this, right? So we need to discuss a nephron, Zach nephron. Okay. Joke you made earlier. So the, yeah, I got it. Recapped it. Went back. Revisited. Did it better. Did I? Anyway, Dead let's back. go. So your kidneys, but I don't know, hundred-ish grams in size, shaped like a kidney bean. Um, if you what were came first, the kidney bean the, or the, the kidney, the bean, the bean. Really? In terms of naming, yeah, the bean was around before the kidney was named a kidney. Right. Yeah. Anyway, um, so if you were to break apart a kidney, uh, there would be about a million nephrons in it. What's a nephron? And so we're going to talk about a nephron now. So the nephron <laughs> is the functional unit. Right. It kind of looks like, uh, I guess, a snake. Yeah. So the head of the snake, um, with, its, with mouth. its mouth open. Yeah. Like a like Pac-Man. A, a looks C- like a Pac-Man. C-shape. That's the glomerulus. Okay. Are you happy with that? Yeah. Now, you put the snake in a into a big letter U. Is that a, fair enough? Right. So the top you of like the, using letters yeah, in the well, way you describe things to, instead of... I don't yeah. know how else you'd say it. So the head of the snake with its mouth open is the glomerulus. This is the place where filtration will take place. Right. Now, going down the... Uh, I'm going to de- let you do all this and then the, I'll, I'll the, do The downward facing part of the U. Right. Okay. That's going to be... Well, the neck of the snake is going to be the, the proximal convoluted tubule. <laughs> More like a proximal convoluted explanation, but go on. <laughs> um. And then when you, because you go to the bottom part of the, the U, yep. this is the loop. Right. Okay. So it's a, a loopy part of the U. <laughs> <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> this, is the, this is the loop of Henley. Right. Okay. And then you go back up to the... What letter um, is this? The ascending part of the U. Yep. This is the... 
Well, it's still part of the loop, isn't it? <laughs> the distal convoluted tubule until we end in the last bit of the tail, the tail of the snake, yep. which is going to be the collecting duct. Right. Now, that little bit of the tail is where all the urine drips out of. Right. Okay. And then that goes into the, essentially the pelvis, the kidney, collects and then goes off to the bladder. Okay. That was all right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, maybe get a round of applause. Oh, and a bit of oh, a it's one. two at one. once. Yeah, two at once. Sorry about that. Um, the audience was divided. <laughs> I'm going to do that with every joke you make about Zach Nephron now. Um, yes. I like that. The nephron is the filtration unit of the kidneys. We have one million per kidney, therefore we have two million. We only need one million to do the adequate filtration process. I don't think process. we even need that much. I think we need probably, probably 700,000. Yeah, well, from two, your studies. Two-thirds of a kidney we need, technically, to yeah. survive. Doesn't mean you should get That's right. rid of one and, but and, te- and But technically, you could give one away. Yep. Um, you Just know. like to a friend down the street, <laughs> just for Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you could survive quite comfortably off one. Yep. But then, you know, you w- you wouldn't want to diminish much more of that. Yes, I agreed. So and so these would this would be c- cases where you have chronic kidney disease. Yeah, that's and a, that's so you're, another topic. you're losing functional nephrons. Right. So let's talk about these nephrons again. So the head of this snake that you said, which is the head of the nephron. Which is that part of, I think, was Look, it okay was and accurate. It was okay. In the mouth of the snake you've got a whole bunch of blood vessels that we call the glomerulus. So the head of the snake is the glomerular capsule, but the blood vessel that enters the snake's mouth is the glomerulus. And so this is going to be a blood vessel... It's like it swallowed a, a, a ball, ball of, of wool. Yarn. Yeah. yeah. It's, or at least it's just sitting there in its mouth. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're going to have a blood vessel entering that ball of yarn. That, that's what glomerulus actually means, is ball of yarn. Um, you've got a blood vessel entering No one uses it. the word yarn anymore. Let's just say wool. May not be wool, maybe nylon. <laughs> okay, right? keep going. Maybe people still do knit with yarn. Uh, and there's going to be uh, another end of that blood vessel exiting that ball, that glomerulus. Yep. So the one coming in is called the afferent arteriole. So it's a very small artery. And there's one that exits the glomerulus called the efferent arteriole. So that's that. We've got that in mind. I always get those mixed up because... It's always the other way around in, in neurology, you know, where A is going away yeah. and E is t- to the effect. Yeah, well, afferent does mean toward yeah. and efferent is away. Okay. So don't, don't, and that's even when you're talking about s- like afferent neurons always goes what? towards the control center or the brain, okay. right. efferent goes that's away. That's probably a better way then. Yep. Uh, so we've got that set in our mind. Like you said, there's different parts of the snake. You've got the proximal convoluted tubule. Which is the neck. The loop of Henle, so the belly. And the distal convoluted tubule, which is towards the tail. And um, then the collecting duct, which the collecting is the duct. tail. Whatever. Um, now You've got to finish it off. Now, here's the thing. You're going to annoy reptile specialists. We're going to annoy our listeners if we don't <laughs> move <laughs> forward with it. The prox- so, okay, so the afferent arteriole that's turning into the glomerulus, it's actually in contact with the distal convoluted tubule. So, so, it's, so its body comes back up near its mouth. That's right. The tail end, the distal convoluted tubule, comes back and is actually in contact with the afferent arteriole. Yeah, so yeah. That's so that's really important. Almost like the into the ball of yarn. Almost, yeah. yes. So this is important because when it comes to renin release, it all happens in the uh, what we call the juxtaglomerular complex or a group Juxta of cells. next to the glomerular. Yes, uh, a group of cells in this area, um, when they get triggered or stimulated, they're going to release. What triggers them? Like a, a Twitter post? Things. Could be. Could be. Everyone gets triggered very a Twitter easily. Po- a Twitter post from the heart and the baroreceptors. Do you reckon will, Renin will gets, trigger them? Do you reckon Renin gets triggered as easily as most people on Twitter? <laughs> Probably not. Um, all right. So uh, let's first start with a drop in blood pressure. Right, this is going to be the most basic stimulus to begin this pathway. The most basic stimulus to begin the s- release. Well, of could renin. you say more accurately just renal hypoperfusion? We'll get there. We'll get there. Let's okay. just start with a drop in blood pressure, just systemically. So let's just say Matt's heart has decided to uh, drop its uh, ability to pump out a strong cardiac output. So his 120 millimeters of mercury of systolic pressure has dropped to 80. Has dropped down. Now, obviously. 
arteries, particularly the aorta, branch into a multitude of other arteries, which obviously, as they split, blood pressure drops because you're diverting blood into multitudes or different areas and the pressure drops. So as you continue through, by the time you get to certain organs and structures, blood pressure has dropped regardless. But by the time it's gotten to the kidneys via the renal artery, blood pressure will have dropped. But if your heart is not pumping out a high pressure anyway, it's going to be very low at the renal artery. Yeah, so... Yeah. Go on. I was just going to say, ultimately the renal artery will be splitting off into a multitude of these vessels and one of which becomes the afferent arteriole. So inside the walls, the endothelia of this afferent arteriole, because remember it's a blood vessel, it's made up of epithelial cells and in blood vessels epithelia is called endothelia. Some of these endothelia are specialised baroreceptors and they pick up pressure changes and they can pick up a drop in pressure in the afferent arteriole of all these kidneys, uh, of all these nephrons, right? They're, like you said, these two million nephrons. And as this pressure drops, it stimulates a certain cell, a very cuboidal looking cell, which is going to be called... Boxhead. Sorry? Boxhead. Boxhead. Or cub cuboidal. Okay, yeah, okay. You could call it a box head <laughs> if you'd like. Uh, this is called a, a, a renin-releasing granular cell okay. or a, a juxtaglomerular cell. So this is part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus? That's right. So they're just a group of cells that are producing within the cells uh, renin. Renin, from yes. So from a, a chemical molecule pro-renin is yep. then cleaved into renin yep. and then renin is stored in granules. And inside then of these cells. Inside these cells and when there is a certain stimulus, they will release it. Yes, that's right. And so one of these stimuli could be the drop in blood pressure in the afferent arteriole, yep. stimulating the baroreceptors, stimulating these. Now, do you want to move forward and call them juxtaglomerular cells yeah, or do you want to call them granular cells? Just call them juxtaglomerular. Okay, so these juxta so for the listener, it's synonymous, yep. same thing. So then that can release renin into the bloodstream. Renin is a protease. Keep that in mind. We'll talk about why that's important. But it's a protease, which means it, it chops up proteins. So that's the first thing. So something else that's really interesting that I thought I'd... Uh, I'll bring it in later. Let's talk about some other ways we'll trigger renin because I've got a, a way that we can inhibit renin, which is really interesting. So that's one way. Yep. The second way I, I think is very interesting, right? So the blood that's coming from the afferent arteriole into the glomerulus that then gets filtered into the mouth of the snake, right? That f and then we produce that filtrate. I think that comes third. What do you mean? In terms of your triggering. Well, there's no order. Well, it just depends on what the primary stimulus. Okay, we can talk about that third. Second, second Let's is second neuronally. One. All right, so you you can do this one. So in this case, since you, you thought it was uh, relevant to interrupt me and stop, yeah, me. it was relevant. Um, <laughs> the certain regions of your body that may also pick up low blood pressure, right? Which could be heart mm -hmm. and. Um, baroreceptors in big blood vessels, like. probably the aortic arch and the cor uh, carotid sinus. What does carotid mean? Um, I think it means, is it to faint? Yeah, that's right. Because ancient physicians would restrict it or constrict it yeah. bilaterally and then you'd pass out. You know who taught me that? No. You. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, <coughs> well, the technique or the where the name came from? <laughs> <laughs> and so when I first met Matt, um, I jabbed you in the neck. I uh, I awoke on the floor <laughs> to see someone standing over the top of me. So he'd give me a rear naked chokehold, and he's like, "Nice to meet you. I'm Doctor Matt." <laughs> I said, "Wow, this is going to be a, a long, tough relationship." So um, yeah, so these two organs are picking up also picking up low so blood pressure. The aortic arch and the carotids they and can pick up, and arguably also the heart. They've got baroreceptors. Yeah, right. And they would pick up a low pressure, which then they would activate the sympathetic nervous system. Yep. And the sympathetic nervous system through a beta-1 receptor, which I believe is in the juxtaglomerular cells. Correct. Would also tell those cells to release renin. That's right. And so that's kind of why I put it here because it's in the same location. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's good. And I'm glad you interrupted. Um, which is, is the only time I'm glad. Whereas the third it. one... Wait, because we're not finished with yes. this part yet. Um the sympathetic nervous system does a couple of other things, though, to in this process. You know, the sympathetic nervous system is going to constrict 
the renal artery and renal arteries, which sort of makes it go, wait a minute, that's, that's not going to benefit filtration, right? Because the whole point here is the kidneys are going, oh no, oh, you know, because this is homeostasis. Yeah. This is a, we've got a drop in something, the kidneys want to respond to increase it. Yeah. So if you've got a drop in blood pressure, that means less blood gets to the kidneys. Yes. It interprets that as, oh no, I'm not filtering enough blood, yeah. I need to respond. Now, if this happens and you respond and the sympathetic nervous system then constricts the renal artery. So it limits even more blood going to the kidneys. You'd think, wait, this isn't beneficial. But what it does is sort of... Keeps amplifying it. Yeah, like preempts it to say, hey, blood pressure's dropping here. You should probably do something about yeah. it. Yeah. Just So I thought that that was an interesting point. To, and then raise. I think also, as we alluded to at the start, that the kidney itself has its own auto-regulation ability with its own intrinsic RAS system. So it can almost try to regulate its own blood flow Locally. independently. Yes. Yeah. Let's, maybe we can talk about that towards yeah. the end. Uh, now, the third way we can trigger the release of renin is... Salt, salt liquors. I told you. <laughs> don't call me these names on the podcast, dude. All right? So, you've got a drop in blood pressure. Or let's say you've got a drop in blood volume. Right? Either one. Doesn't matter what's happening. Uh, so... Maybe someone's going, going really. into shock, right? So someone's bleeding out. Maybe let's just say I've cut you. Maybe you've called me a salt licker and I've decided to cut you. You're bleeding Emotionally. out. Emotionally. Oh, physically. Physically okay. cut you from that emotional slight. You're bleeding out, blood volume's dropped, but also blood pressure will inevitably drop because they're inextric inextricably linked. Less blood going to the kidneys. Now, if you've got less blood going to the kidneys, that means less filtrate. filtrate is being produced. It also means that the pressure behind that filtrate, that pushing force to push the plasma through the glomerulus to be filtered, that's dropped too, which means the filtrate moving through the nephrons are moving through more slowly. Now, I said to you that we filter 200 litres of Filter, we create 200 litres of filtrate, but we only pee out 1% of that. Mm. So 99% of it, at some point, whether it's the proximal convoluted tubules, the looper Henle or the distal convoluted tubules, at some point, 99% of all this stuff gets reabsorbed back into the blood. Right. So we need to keep that in mind. If your filtrate is moving through more slowly because the blood pressure's dropped or the blood volume's dropped, it gives those tubules of the nephron more time to reclaim content back into the bloodstream that makes sense right yeah. like uh, the it's way like, it's like running a gauntlet i was just going to use that example if you had like um what's the like uh like touch touch football have you ever played touch football tag, where tag. you ta Oz, Oz tag Oz tag so you've got like so this is probably something that our international listeners don't know uh if if you're like matt and you don't like to get tackled in a game of football you can play something this is this Oz is tag. this is not soccer football this is no. uh rugby Rugby. Yeah, so if so, what you can do is if you don't want to get tackled, you can wear a belt that's got a whole bunch of little, like, uh, like look like tyres, little flags hanging off it. Little Vel bits Vel of Velcro tyres, aren't they? Yeah, and so they hang off your belt and you've got an, a number of them. Now, if you're moving... Now, the point of, is that the competitor tries to pull one off and if they pull one off, uh, you, you, you're out, basically, right? You've been tackled. You've been, you've been tapped. Yes. Uh, now, the faster you move, the less likely someone's going to pull that off you the more slowly you move the more likely it's going to happen so that was the analogy yep. i hijacked from that you were just about to explain but we got there in the end we, we did i apologize but that's exactly how it's working here if it's moving through more slowly the different tubules have an opportunity to reclaim so generally speaking what is it reclaiming that we're focusing on here it's salt sodium and chloride so 65 percent of our salt gets reclaimed at the proximal convoluted tubule 15 percent gets reclaimed at the loop of henley and another five-ish percent gets reclaimed at the distal convoluted tubule. But this percentage goes up if it moves through more slowly. Right. So if you think about that, once this blood pressure and blood volume is dropped, by the time you get to the distal convoluted tubule, if I had some sort of salt measurer and measured the content of salt in the distal convoluted tubule, is it going to be higher or lower? Lower. That's right. And this is what these salt liquors are. What are they called? They are called macula densa. Beautiful. So think dense as density, and it's measuring the density or concentration of salt in the distal convoluted so tubule. So these, these are still part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus though, right? Yes, because we said the distal convoluted tubule is in contact with the afferent arteriole, which, and remember the afferent arteriole 
releases renin. Mm. They're in contact. So the distal convoluted tubule, or specifically the macula densa cells, are picking up the salt concentration. In the tubule, it's going, hey, it's low. I know that means blood pressure's low or blood volume's low. It then speaks to, because it's in close contact. Does it speak to or it itself releases renin? No, it speaks to re- it speaks to the renin releasing juxtaposition oh, really? cells. Yes, okay. Because there's the um, uh, there's cells that sit between. So is this like the a, afferent arterial a paracrinal the, conversation? Yeah. So there, there's just a whole bunch of um, the, I think they call like extra juxtaglomerular cells, something like that. Mesangial cells. Mesangial cells that sort of sit between the afferent arterial and the distal convoluted tubule, and so they're triggered to tell renin to be released so that's the third way great so we've got three ways to release renin drop in blood pressure in the afferent arterial stimulates juxtaglomerular cells to release renin directly we've got sympathetic nervous system stimulates beta 1 cells on the juxtaglomerular cells to stimulate renin release directly you've also got uh, a drop in uh, sodium concentration in the distal convoluted tubule in the filtrate yep in the filtrate which triggers the macula densa cells which indirectly stimulates renin release from the juxtaglomerular cells brilliant renin's release now here's that third point this sorry here's that final point i wanted to say about inhibiting renin did you know vitamin d3 inhibits renin release where do you get this from a it was a Random double-blind placebo-controlled trial, people with diabetes, where they gave them vitamin D3 supplements. So ha- what's D3 opposed to just standard D? The, uh, uh, an ingestible form. Like it, it's already activated? So uh, well it, it, it's, it comes in activated opposed to inactive? Basically, but it's also the oral form that you can in- take, right? Right. So D3 is the um, vitamin supplement that you take. But is that, you know how like essentially... It will be converted if if not use, if not uh, the active form directly, it will be converted to right. the active form. Okay. Uh, so the people that took that supplement as opposed to the placebo, um, they had decreases in systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure and they've shown also that it directly inhibits the pro-renin... Uh, transcription right. so vitamin d3 inhibits or reduces blood pressure by inhibiting renin okay. so this is one of the and we know that a good chunk of the population is probably vitamin d deficient yeah and one of the reasons why vitamin d can be beneficial for your blood pressure there we go how's that interesting is this recent no no we've known this for a little while okay yeah a couple of years maybe five years so thought that was interesting all right so we've got uh, renin has now been released. So the very first part of this pathway, tick, renin's released. Done. That's the R. What's the next part? The next part is we have to bring the A into the mix. Oh, please. Let's not be so vulgar. A is the, well, at this, this point is angiotensinogen. And right. the ogen means that it's in an inactive form. All so right, it, all right. it still needs to generate its angiotensin part. Okay. Where are most stored in an active uh, chemicals in the body. If if you had to guess, where would you most likely guess these stored and active chemicals tend to sit? Proteins specifically, like this one. Um, I'll give you a clue. Starts with L and ends in IVA. What about <laughs> pancreas then? Some yeah. liver has most though. This is my okay. point: is that if you had a question in an exam which ended in O G E N, what organ produces it? I would guess the liver. Okay. Because you would have the better chance of getting that correct. There we go. So angiotensinogen is so released by the liver. Yeah, so by the liver. this is, uh, what would you call it? Is it a globulin protein? Yeah. Okay, so it's produced by the liver. It's pretty much, there are other organs that will make this, but yeah. liver is the, the vast majority of, uh, in terms of the amount of it that you would find in the body, would yeah, come from right. the liver. Yeah, yeah. Some of the things that would... Increase its release right. is estrogen and also gl- uh, glucocorticoids. Really? That also increases its Do we release. Know why? Um, I think that glucocorticoids probably make sense considering it ex- it's going to have a very similar um, role in terms of a steroid than the mineral corticoids. So that's like aldosterone, which we'll oh, get yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's crossover there. 
So it inhibits it or activates it? No, but it? both of those activate. Okay. Or increase the release Why of it. Why estrogen? Do we know? Not sure. Okay. No, I can't think of it. Um, so is there a correlation between estrogen and hypertension? You'd think so. Definitely in um, pregnancy, but that could also be from fluid amount right. as well. Yeah, but, okay. but pregnancy, blood pressure is definitely quite high. And yep. That can be um, some problems in pregnancy associated with high blood pressure. And this is directly angiotensinogen, not angiotens, not not the next step. Oh, gen. Yep, okay. definitely. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, and so there are some individuals who have gene upregulation of this particular protein and that could also maybe predispose them. So I didn't look into this, and maybe you didn't either, but I'm going to ask anyway. Is angiotensinogen constitutively activated? What that means is, is it constant, is it a housekeeping uh, protein that's always being made and released? Or does it need to be made and released in response to the renin production? Oh, my understanding is it's always in your blood. Okay. So it's always being released. Right. I think there are some situations where maybe... I could have this wrong, but I think in um, nephrotic syndrome where you're losing a lot of proteins yep. and your liver has to make up up them, a whole lot of other proteins get made alongside them. Right, so, okay. Like gamma goblins and so forth. So maybe in those cases where the liver is being told um, we're deficient in other proteins yeah. just and by just default it makes more of this protein. Gotcha. But my understanding is that it's always present. Okay. So it's not been necessarily told to release more by this whole process being activated. Okay, so we've got uh, simultaneously angiotensinogen being produced and released by the liver into the bloodstream. We've got renin that's being produced and released into the bloodstream. I said earlier that renin is a protease. Yep. You just told us that angiotensinogen is, is a globular protein, yep. is an inactive globular protein. Well, bingo bango. Yeah. Put some, those two together. There's going to be some cutting. There's going to be some cutting, baby. And renin cuts angiotensinogen, cuts the OGEN off and produces angiotensin. So it actually produces something called angiotensin 1, which has yep. another name, which is angiotensin 1 to 10. What does that mean? Uh, there's there's isomers of it? Like correct. 10 different... Yes. Cups. Is it isomers the correct term? I don't know if... Uh, well... Probably. I don't want to jump into that. I would assume yes, but angiotensin 1 is also known as angiotensin 1 to 10. Okay. And it doesn't do a great deal. Do you have any functions of angiotensin no, 1? No, I couldn't find it. I, but find I did find it's a, a decapeptide. So it is. What's That's why deca? it says 1 to 10. Oh, there we go. Right? So it, it's saying it's I just thought that 10 was peptide units. That's exactly... Yes, that's yeah. what it is. That's right. The 1 to 10 says it's 10 peptide units and you can cleave the units... Right? Oh, okay. So so this is the important point. Now that renin has turned angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1, which is also known as angiotensin 1 to 10, yeah. a decapeptide with 10 peptides associated with it, it's flowing through the bloodstream, not doing much, until it comes across what? Um, the ace of the pack of cards. Oh, the ace of spades. <laughs> the ace of spades. It, the it's ace of spades. What's the, the ace other? of spades. No. Sorry, do you know who sings that? That, that's a... No, tell me. Um, I'm just trying to remember now. It's no, how have I forgotten? Motorhead. Who's the lead singer of Motorhead? I, oh think, no. I think he went to... Um, correct. I think he went to Rage Against Machine for a while. No, he didn't. Yeah, I think so. Really? Maybe I've got the... Let's have a look. Lead singer of Mo uh, Lenny. It's got to be... Le Lemmy, 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 Lemmy. There we no, go. I got that wrong then. Yeah. Lemmy, I'm quite sure Lemmy did not... No, no, it wasn't him. Yeah. It was... I can't remember now. Anyway. Uh, Ace. You said Ace. Ace of Spades. Maybe, maybe the Ace of uh, Rass. So, <laughs> Ace. Ace is an well, acronym. Like, well, we'll go with the spade because it's going to get that um, decapeptide and chop off two bits of it. Okay, that's good. Okay. So, like a shovel, boom, right. cuts off two bits yep. and now it's an octapeptide. And it's also known as angiotensin? Two. Which has another name, which is angiotensin 1 to 8. Right. Right? Well, th there's Octo. the octopeptide. There you go. Yeah. All right. So, uh, ACE. Th now, this is angiotensin converting enzyme. So, so it converts 1 to 2. Yep. Uh, and it's actually called ACE1. There's an ACE2, right? Oh, you mean the... Okay, yes. Because ACE is an enzyme. Where's it released? 
What released it? Well, ACE, you mean where's ACE located? Where's, correct, where's ACE, yeah, because it's a transmembrane enzyme. Right. It actually can be free form in the, in the, in the bloodstream, but it c- can be produced and um, across the entire membrane where its functional um, surface is facing the bloodstream. So it can chop up angiotensin one into angiotensin two. Right. Where predom- what tissues are predo- what tissues are predominantly producing ACE? Well, I think uh, ACE ones in this case. Okay, uh, I think predominantly it's in vascular tissue, but specifically in the pulmonary vascular tissue. Yeah. Now, previously, when I previously used to teach RAS, I never used to bother about saying ACE one. I just said ACE. But now, since twenty nineteen. We probably need to delineate between ACE one and ACE two. Yeah. Why? Uh, well, twenty nineteen coming to twenty twenty, we had a we had a pandemic. We did. That's what you're referring to, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and this particular virus, this coronavirus, would bind to so its spike protein would dock onto ACE two receptors. That's right, ACE two. And I remember. I think you and I had a conversation at the time. I think I actually posted a Twitter to Dr. Carl. And did he respond? He responded, but he was very generic. Yeah. I don't think he knew. I don't, yeah. Well, I don't think anyone knew. Yeah. But I think... So, okay, let's just rewind. So, we've got ACE1. It converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, we're going to talk very shortly about what angiotensin 2 does. But very broadly... It increases blood pressure and blood volume. Does a lot of stuff. Right. Does a lot of stuff, but at the end of the day, its purpose is to it's negative homeostatic feedback. The stimulus was a drop in blood pressure and drop blood volume. Angiotensin's two job is to increase blood pressure, blood volume. Basically its job in life is to stop renin being released. Don't say that. Well, yes, but it confuses it. But you're totally right. Totally right. Now, let's that's ACE one is what converts angiotensin one to angiotensin two, so this can happen. Now, angiotensin, oh, sorry. Now, ACE2 takes angiotensin 2, which is doing this increasing blood pressure, increasing blood volume function, and chops it up, chops another peptide off. You t- told us that angiotensin. No, 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 no. So, angiotensin 2 is, uh, you said octopeptide, right? Yeah. Also known as angiotensin 1 to 8. Right. That has the, its function is to increase blood pressure yep. and blood volume. All because of ACE1. When ACE2 comes into play, it takes angiotensin 2 and chops it again. What's what's 7? Sept, sept peptide. Is that right? What's pent? Pent, maybe. Pent peptide. Yeah. So. Or hept. Maybe it's hept. Hept. Oh, maybe hept. I think it's pets 5. Pents. Pens 5. Okay. Whatever 7 is. <laughs> it chops one more peptide off yeah. and makes it angiotensin 1 to 7. Okay. Now, angiotensin 1 to 7 is does the opposite of angiotensin 2. So, it reduces blood pressure, reduces blood volume, and reduces all the other effects, which we'll talk about, oh, that yeah. angiotensin I d- actually had does. that on this pathway I printed off. Okay. You just yep. didn't pay attention to it. So, that's, so angiotensin 2's job... In short, is to oppose uh, uh, ACE2's job, the angiotensin converting enzyme, its job is to do the opposite of ACE1's job. ACE2 ultimately drops blood pressure, blood volume. ACE2, ACE1 increases blood pressure, blood volume. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so what you said was that SARS CoV 2 binds to ACE2 and uses it as a docking port to get into the cell. And it's located in our lungs, in our brain, in our heart, in vascular tissue, right? And therefore, that it's having that effect. And it tends to impede its effect, which fluctuates the ratio of ACE1, ACE2 to favour ACE1, which favours angiotensin 2, which means, seems to be that people who have SARS-CoV-2 have a RAS stimulatory effect, right. which is to increase blood pressure, Increase blood volume, increase inflammation, increase vascular damage, increase heart r- remodeling, restructuring, increase changes in vasculature of the brain, and so forth. Wow! So, so it's all driven that way. Yeah, that's th- from what I can tell from the literature. Yes, that's amazing. Anything you'd like to add with 
with that particular point? Uh, are we still on ACE or just the the nuance of the different types of sub sub subtypes? Yeah, we can finish that if you like. Okay. And move on to angiotensin 2 and its function. Well, there's a few things I'll just add to yeah. ACE generally. Yep. So going to when uh, it was first discovered, so there were scientists that were looking at um, <clears throat> the effect of some venoms from snakes right. that would cause a drop in blood pressure. So they knew that if you were bitten by, let's say, vipers, that you would get a, a huge drop in blood pressure. Huh. Okay, and so they were kind of looking at how um, the role of bradykinin um, and its uh, metabolic products would then... So bradykinin is vasodilatory? It must be. Okay. Yep. And so then they started to find that there was crossover between this enzyme ACE and bradykinin. Okay. Do we know which ACE we're talking about here? This was probably going to be the... ACE1. Yeah. The one involved in RAS. Correct. Okay. Yep. And so therefore they started to find that if you were to block ACE, then you would have a change in blood pressure, but it also would cause a, a buildup of bradykinin as a result. Okay. Okay. Now because the ACE, which is primarily been produced is in the lung tissue if you use some medications so ace inhibitors right i think i know where you're going blocking would cause up an increase in bradykinin because that's some of the metabolic products of similar enzymatic activity bradykinin is and can be an irritant yeah and so a common side effect of uh, ace inhibitors is to get a chronic cough Look at that. I mm. thought we didn't know what caused the chronic cough. Is well, that's that the, the hypothesis? That's the hypothesis. I lo- it makes total sense. And so then going to... Because prostaglandins... Sorry to interrupt, but um, you know the, the way that um, renin is released through sympathetic stimulation and through the macular denser cells... So obviously, the baroreceptors directly release renin from the juxtaglomerular cells. But the way that the sympathetic nervous system does it and the way that the um, macular denser cells do it is through the release of nitric oxide and prostaglandins. Right. So I assume maybe bradykinins also come into play because they also, they tend to get spoken about yeah. together. Yeah. Right? So anyway, I thought I'd just... But that. I think that also brings into play, again, the way that, let's say, the kidneys uh, auto-regulate these systems. Yeah. And prostaglandin being one. So the possibility of the RAS system intrinsically to the kidney trying to regulate its own blood flow, mm. but prostaglandin may be countering that, is partly for if you were an individual predisposed to having a imbalance of your RAS within your kidney itself, not the whole system that we're doing, just in the kidney, to auto-regulate blood flow through it. And then you were to start to bring in inhibitors of prostaglandins, yeah. which would normally play a role in... Um, Vasodilation. Re- vasodilation and bringing blood flow. And so you now inhibit in that, then you could put a situation where you're increasing the likelihood of kidney injury. Yeah, by reducing renal perfusion. Yeah. Because the, the vasoconstricting are constricting the afferent arterial. Mm. Yeah. All right, so are we up to angiotensin 2 and all of, it, all of its wonderful functions? Yes, I think so. Okay. So we've got angiotensin 2 now, which is produced by ACE1 from angiotensin 1. Chopped off uh, one, uh, no, chopped off two peptides to go from angiotensin one, which is AT one to eight, uh, one to ten, into AT one to eight. This is angiotensin two. I've just over confused that, so I apologise for that. Angiotensin two has the most important functions here. It is profound. Profound, says Matthew. All right, what's one of the things that angiotensin two does? Well, I think probably the biggest effect on on this whole system or in terms of the outcome that you want to achieve or the kidneys want to achieve yeah. is quite profound vascular constriction. Yes. So all the small blood vessels that will play a role in distribution, Yep. is that right? Yep. They would then constrict up, which that change in diameter of blood vessel plays a quite a significant role in blood pressure. Yes. So systematic... Res- uh, Systematic? Systemic. Systemic, there we go. Uh, Vascular resistance, which would bump up blood pressure quite profoundly. Yes. So angiotensin 2 is a generalized vasoconstrictor. It's constricting those blood vessels, increasing systemic vascular resistance, increasing the heart's requirement to produce a more forceful contraction. 
uh, and pushing more blood out, thereby increasing blood pressure. So tick, it's it's negative feedback on homeostasis. The stimulus was a drop in blood pressure. What have we got now? An increase in blood pressure. Yep. All right, what's another thing that angiotensin 2 does? Well, the other thing it, it's going to play a role with is the sodium balance. Yes. So it's going to try to get more water back into your blood because generally speaking, if you have more water, you have more volume, you have more um, pre preload and therefore more cardiac output, right? Absolutely. And, and if you increase cardiac output, that's one of the main parameters to blood pressure. We that's already right. spoke about one being the resistance of blood vessels. But if you can also increase the amount of fluid coming out of the heart per minute, therefore blood pressure by default will go up. And it does this two ways. First way is that angiotensin 2 goes to the adrenal glands, the little hat that sits on top of the kidneys. That's indirectly though. We could do it directly. Okay. And so it can angiotensin 2 can go straight to the proximal convoluted tubule and just – does it – I guess it doesn't make more – what does it do to salt? How does it do the salt part? Through aldosterone. That's going to be at the DCT. But yes. At, but at the proximal convoluted tubule, it also increases... It probably increases... Um, sodium one the, reabsorption. One of the uh, sodium transporters in the, in the, in the wall. It probably um, inhibits one of the sodium... I, I don't know. I haven't heard of this function of it. Yeah. So it, it either will increase a symporter or... Sorry, a... Um, but I don't think it's going to work the way, way aldosterone works, which is increasing like the production of sodium carriers. Maybe mm. it's just, yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay. But, but it will have a role directly at the proximal convolutional. Increasing sodium reabsorption yep. back into the body. And then indirectly via aldosterone. So that means the angiotensin 2 travels to the adrenal gland, yeah. uh, which is the hat that sits on top of the kidneys, stimulates it to release aldosterone. And aldosterone being a hormone... Uh, steroid, a hormone steroid hormone yep. goes to the distal convoluted tubule, increases the uh, sodium transporters to increase the amount of sodium to that goes back into the bloodstream. Yep. And wherever salt goes, water follows. So sodium back into the blood means water back into the blood, which means as blood volume goes up, blood pressure goes up. Perfect. That's what we wanted. The other thing that uh, it does is it travels to the hypothalamus, triggers the release of antidiuretic hormone, or if you're in the US, vasopressin from the posterior pituitary. And that does a similar thing to aldosterone, goes to the distal convoluted tubule, but doesn't play around with salt. It plays around with water directly. Good. So it puts aquaporins into the membrane, which are just little channels for water, uh, and reabsorbs water directly back into the bloodstream. Increasing blood volume, increasing blood pressure. Perfect. Now, the other thing that angiotensin 2 does is it's an efferent arteriole constrictor. And I... Yeah, keep going. Okay. I'm going to add to this. Sure. So the efferent arteriol is the blood vessel that leaves the glomerulus. And so if you think about it like this, you've got the blood vessel going into the glomerulus, the afferent. Then you've got the glomerulus where the filtration occurs. Then you've got the blood vessel leaving called the efferent. If you constrict the efferent arteriol, blood is backing up back into the glomerulus, which increases the pressure at the, f at the filter, right, which increases the filtration which increases the glomerular filtration rate, which is ultimately what the kidneys wanted. Perfect tick with increased glomerular filtration rate. Yeah, the, the only thing that I, what I came across was I found that not only does it to the efferent, it does it to the afferent, yes. and it also does it to the interlobular artery. Yes, so, but it does it to a lesser degree. Yeah, because so yeah. that, that's the part I couldn't think of how. Because if you're constricting the afferent, so you're bringing less blood in, but you're also constricting the output, then... Don't they counter each other? But like you said, maybe the efferent is more It is far more potent. Yeah, it and is. But as a result, you have a greater hydrostatic pressure in the glomerulus, yep. which is increasing the GFR. That's right. Yeah. So angiotensin 2, it's, effects, it's a generalized vasoconstrictor, increasing blood pressure. It constricts the efferent arteriole, increasing glomerular filtration rate. It stimulates aldosterone, which increases the reabsorption of salt, which increases the reabsorption of water, which increases blood volume, which increases blood pressure. It stimulates the release of ADH, which increases the reabsorption of water, which increases blood volume, which increases blood pressure. Any other functions of angiotensin 2? The only thing I'll say here is uh, I came across, again, in the literature that the angiotensin 2 has two different types of receptors. 
it has receptor one and receptor two. Okay. Okay. Yes. Now receptor one is pretty much the, what we just spoke of. It is. Yeah. Type one receptor. It's called. So these would be found on blood vessels. So that would lead to vasoconstriction. Yep. They would be found on the PCT. So that would lead to uh, salt, specifically. Um, uh, yeah, salt, salt reabsorption at the PCT, essentially. Yep. Um, there's the, the angiotensin 1 receptors located in the... Um, gl- no, sorry. Um, the, the adrenal gland the, for aldosterone. Yep. And it's also located in the sympathetic nervous system. Yes. And so that they all have a significant role in what we just said. But they will also play a role. There's also receptors that will play a role in some deleterious activity. Okay. So like fibrotic activities and inflammatory activities. So are they type 1? Type 1. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why, because we might think of the RAS and go, oh, this is great. Blood pressure drops, blood volume drops. We've got this system. How wonderful. That's true. But like most homeostatic control mechanisms, it's their short term. You want to yeah. you want on and off to keep you alive. That's right. But Not if all you've the got time. some issue where it's consti- uh, constantly being activated, um, it's going to lead to deleterious effects like inflammation and so fibrosis, yeah, so remodeling. So what I found was it's also located on white blood cells, yep, uh, endothelial cells, and vascular smooth muscle. Yep, and so if you overactivate they those <laughs> those things. Um, that could lead to inflammatory changes. And yeah. spe- especially if you think about the heart at the endothelial cells and the vascular smooth muscle, if you're going to cause fibrotic reactions, that could then lead to a condition, you know, in least in blood vessels, known as atherosclerosis. Yeah. And that's going to be a basis for, you know, arguably the two biggest killers. Or even just clots directly. Yeah. Um, which is going to be stroke or... Uh, heart attacks. Yeah. Yeah. But also the possibility of making insulin resistance as well. Yeah. But then you have the angio... It also re- results in hypertrophy if it's yeah, constantly of, being of activated. Of the heart? Of the heart. So yeah. you get cardiac remodeling. Yeah. Yeah. So then you can go to the, the other type of receptor, the angiotensin 2 receptor, and this seems to have almost the opposite effect. Right. So it has a vasodilatory... Dilatory. I'll wait for you to get it right. Dilatation effect. <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to excrete sodium. It seems to also be antifibrotic and anti-inflammatory. Thankfully, the body's got two sides of every coin. And so the thought here was that if you were to block the first receptor, right, which we do have. Yeah, angiotensin 1 receptor blockers. So, yep, or ARBs. Yep. Okay. The thought was, if you block these through medications, okay, so these would be the Sartan medications. Right. Okay, so if you were to block these receptors, then by default, you would have an increase in angiotensin 2, yeah. which would then have an effect on the other receptor types. Does that happen? Apparently not really no, clinically. So there, so there doesn't seem to be a, a great outcome in that s- sense. Yeah. Yeah, like, but but saying that there may be some effect of angiotensin two on the angiotensin two receptor yep. for causing vasodilation, which may improve blood pressure. Cool, but in terms of they haven't really found clinically a huge, you know, protective mechanism through this. Yeah, drugs. Well, should we just quickly talk about aldosterone? Go for it. Yeah, I thought we did. What what did we not say about it? Did we talk about aldosterone? Yeah, I spoke about how angiotensin two goes to the adrenal gland, the hat that sits on the kidneys. Okay, I think we just spoke that it's released. So, but, anyway. I, but we said it goes to the distal convoluted tube. It all yeah. reabsorbs. So sodium. okay. So let me just I'll just point out a couple of things I've Go for jotted it. down here. That's so okay. so we've got aldosterone, which is released from the adrenal cortex. Yep, it's a steroid hormone. It has the receptor angiotensin 1 receptor on its cortex. Um, So it's going to be primarily stimulated by angiotensin 2, which we said. Um, Angiotensin 2, sorry, aldosterone, because it is a steroid hormone, it has the ability to change genes. Yep. So when it goes to the distal convoluted tubule, it will basically upregulate the production of a pump, 
ATPase pump, but also a sodium channel, which is going to be its primary job. Now, its outcome is increase in salt back into your blood from the tubules, increase in water, but so uh, but potassium secretion. Yeah. So you actually will lose potassium as a result. That's right. Now, because you're in the um, adrenal cort- well, adrenal gland, cortisol has a very similar structure, I guess, yep. to aldosterone. So aldosterone, uh, cortisone, sorry, cortisol can also have the same, to a lesser degree, function to aldosterone. Yes. Okay. But primarily cortisol will be converted to cortisone and cortisone doesn't act on the aldosterone effect, uh, aldosterone receptor. Yes. But cortisol will. So cortisol, if you were to have a disease that, or you were taking medications that had a high amount of cortisol in your blood, then that could have an outcome similar to having high aldosterone. Yep. Okay. And then high aldosterone would be, if it was driven by the adrenal gland, would be a primary aldosteremia. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. And as a result of that, you can get hypertension, but also potassium loss. Yes. Interestingly, I came across that licorice yes. will have the same outcome if you've eaten it in excess. Yeah. To having a primary aldosteremia. Yeah, that's right. Because because Chemical. the licorice blocks the conversion of cortisol to cortisone. Mm. And so then you have more cortisol. I think there's like a thousand uh, proportionally more cortisol to aldosterone. So then by just having more cortisol available, you're going to have an aldosterone effect. And if you think about it, when you have a drop in blood pressure, a drop in blood volume uh, and stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system directly innervates the adrenal gland to release adrenaline, yeah. but also to release cortisol. Yeah. And so you've got a multitude of effects here. And like you said, cortisol will have an aldosterone-like effect at the distal convoluted tubule. So, yeah, I think there's m- multiple roads that sort of lead in to aldosterone, its effects and aldosterone-like effects from other similar hormones like cortisol. And similar to what we saw with the an- angiotensin 2, then having high amounts of aldosterone in the blood can also lead to deleterious effects through inflammatory and fibrotic changes. Mm which can do the example that we spoke about with the heart, the cardiovascular system, but it can also lead to surprisingly things like insulin resistance, obesity, and metabolic syndrome. And also hypokalemia as well, because obviously you exchange the sodium for the potassium. So you increase sodium back in the body, but potassium goes in your pee. Correct. So that can be an issue because then that changes your hydrogen ion concentration in your cells and you can get uh, a change in your pH balance. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of things that can happen. And that might be a consideration when you look at using drugs that play around with aldosterone. You may want to hold on to that potassium. And so these are sometimes known as potassium sparing diuretics. So is this now our lead in into drugs of RAS? Yes, we may as well do it now. Okay. Yep. So uh, we all know the RAS pathway now. So that's really good. Renin, then angiotensin, then... ACE, then angiotensin 2, then aldosterone. Yep. So there's effectively five different areas that you could sort of play around with this pathway to mitigate it or drop it. Now, why would you want to play with this pathway? You uh, alluded to it earlier, is in that people who have hypertension, high blood pressure, uh, we could go, well, we don't really know what's necessarily causing it, but we do know that there is a long-term blood pressure management system in the body called RAS. Maybe if we play around or tweak one of these factors, it's going to reduce blood pressure. And that's what we do. We chuck a bunch of drugs that can affect one or more of these pathway, parts of the pathway and see what it does to reduce blood pressure. Yeah. So one of the first ones is... Those so these would, when you say one of the first ones, so usually as we spoke about... Oh, sorry, I don't mean by gold standard or anything. I just was going oh, okay. first in the pathway. But we can go whichever way you you like with it. Well, I was just going to say, if you were to be diagnosed with hypertension, high blood pressure, which would have to be done over subsequent visits to your doctor, Yeah. but if you were diagnosed, chances are it would be a diagnosis made um, which is caused by a primary or essential hypertension. Yeah. So the doctor probably doesn't really know what's causing it. And so they're going to give... There's there's a 
a list of medications that would be used to see how the person would respond to the medication. Yeah. And so generally speaking, like you said, the gold standard are, are going to be the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers. Yeah, yeah. And so the ACE inhibitors are usually the prills, but the common side effect, so that's blocking the ACE enzyme, but as we spoke about, one of the side effects of this, very common side effects is the chronic cough, yeah. which can be annoying en- enough for the person not wanting to continue. Sure. And so then the other option that's very similar to ACE would be the angiotensin receptor blockers. Yep, the ARBs. Now, I did come across there is one medication that blocks renin production. Yep, direct renin inhibitor. But it really isn't used too widely clinically. Do we know why? Well... It's not very effective. Yeah, right? which is surprising because when... You at start right, at the park, right at the start, you yeah. said that this is the rate limiting step. That's right. So if you were to block renin to begin with, everything else stops. Mm. Whereas if you block, as I said, if you block uh, angiotensin uh, angiotensin 2 yeah. uh, receptor, yeah. then angiotensin 2 builds up. Yeah. Whilst if you block ACE, angiotensin 1 builds up. Yeah. So I think what happens potentially is that the body does evolve mechanisms that if I, you were to stop the very first step, there's other parts that come in to continue the pathway. But if you block the end of the pathway, there's nothing that can be done at the end. Do yep. you know what I mean? Yep. And so that's why it's probably always better to go to the la- one of the last things and then inhibit that. So you can have a direct renin inhibitor, you can have an ACE inhibitor, you can have an angiotensin receptor blocker, and you can even have aldosterone inhibitors yep. like spironolactone. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there you go. And these are the these. Did you want to talk in more detail about these or? No, I think. I mean, we've done that in the blood pressure one. Yeah. So, so I think we've covered that. So anything else you'd like to say before we move on to listen a mail? No, the only thing I'll say is but we alluded to it at the start, is that this classic pathway that we've gone through is how it happens throughout the whole body. Yep. But many organs will do this intrinsic to themselves. So the kidney, as we spoke about, will have this own RAS pathway just for its own homeostasis. Yes, yes, yes. And blood vessels will do it. The heart will do it. Yeah. Brain will do it. Even the reproductive system will do it. Makes it complex, doesn't it? Yeah. So um, sometimes... When you have a condition like hypertension, it may not be because of the classical RAS being out of whack. Yeah. It could be that the way that the kidneys intrinsically is trying to regulate its own autoregulatory right. mechanism right. is affecting blood pressure for the whole body. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Which, again, makes it so tricky. Yeah. All right. That was the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. We do have some listener mail. So we can jump into that. Do you want me to begin? I've got one open up right yeah, here. Yep. Okay, so I've got one here from Ralph. Ralph is from Germany. And Ralph says, Hi, I've become a big fan of your YouTube channel. I study the brain, more or less, just for fun or because it is a great help with work every day on the goal of becoming a better sports coach. That's awesome. Good to hear. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, especially in the videos under the... Lo- so this is referencing some of our YouTube videos <coughs> that we did live uh now there's a, an occasional reference to a study guide ralph has said and so uh he's asked is there a possibility although i'll need to translate into german to get this study guide now unfortunately ralph the videos i did under the live section on our youtube channel that was for your students that was during covid i was stuck at home i had to teach my students so i did live youtube videos on the youtube channel because i didn't have another youtube channel or anything else i could do And so I was talking directly to my university students about their study guide. So unfortunately, I don't have a study guide that I can release to a general audience. So I do apologize about that. But in saying that, if you go to drmatt.drmike.com.au to our website, soon, we don't have it yet, we will have a range of written materials that you'll be able to access which will be very similar to study guides. So, Ralph, watch this space and thank you for the email. Okay, this one is from Adrian. Adrian Yo, is a, Adrian! Is, is a junior doctor in the SA. So, that could be South Australia or South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. Or um, Sinoatrial. <laughs> out on my community service. 
Thank you so much for your topic explanations. The pain lecture was amazing. Still working my way through the topics. I only discovered you guys this year. Cool. Full stop. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, I've got one, and again, I haven't. We haven't read any of these emails, so if if anything jumps out, that uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, we'll just go. So we've got one from Rachel Hoffman. Thank you, Rachel, so much for this email. However, let me read it first, just in case it's not saying let's hate Matt and throw him in the bin, which I would agree with. And then thank you for that. Me email. too. Uh, I've been listening to your podcast for a while, and it's the only podcast I listen to consistently. That warms the cockles of my heart. I love hearing that. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask if you had seen Cells at Work. I've seen Men at Work. They were pretty good, love. They're Australian. Uh, they are. Um, land Down Under. Down Under, yeah. That's yeah. the only song you know. No, no, no. No, no, no. Okay. Uh, 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 Colin Hay, who's the lead singer, uh, he just released a new Who single Can It Be album. Now? Yes, Who Can It Be Now? His rendition of uh, Across the Universe, which is a Beatles song, stunning. Stunning. Okay. Just him and a guitar, baby. What about the Scrubs episode? Uh, did you watch Scrubs when it was on? Not through the whole, all seasons. So one of the early episodes, Colin Hayes in it playing the guitar and he sings that, I can't get to sleep. I think about the implications. Yeah, I think I've seen Diving that. into deep. That's one of my favorite episodes and I love that song. So anyway, um, no, uh, not Men at Work, Cells at Work. Uh, it's a manga and anime about cells and it's incredibly detailed. Hell, uh, no idea. That is awesome. There is an even less known anime and manga called Cells at Work Code Black that goes into more details about how the body manages alcohol, gout, UTIs, blood clots. That's awesome. I'm going to have to look. Is it, Rachel, where can I access this? Is this on Netflix? Is this on, you know, all the uh, relevant channels? Can I, can I get it on Paramount, what about, can I get it on uh, Stan? Oh, they probably don't have Stan. Disney. In the US, uh, Disney, maybe. Maybe it's on, uh, I think there is an anime, like one that you can download called, no, I don't know what it's called now. Okay, let me know. I noticed in the recent podcast about connective tissue that defective collagen production and Ehlers Danlos syndrome wasn't mentioned in the slightest and I was disappointed. I do apologize about that, uh, only because we weren't talking about disease states at the time and there's a number of connective tissue diseases and disorders that we didn't touch upon or mention because it would have taken, particularly Matt, down rabbit holes that we didn't want to go down. But you're right, uh, Ehlers Danlos syndrome uh is uh, an important condition of connective tissue that I think we're going to do a podcast on in itself. So thank you so much, Rachel. Really appreciate the email. All right, this is from Abby and the subject is anemia. Hi from Canada. I love the podcast and YouTube videos. They have been super helpful. <clears throat> One topic that I've heard briefly mentioned but not gone into details is anemia, both with low iron and low B12. I think we should do an episode on anemia right? we should that's actually uh one that is it's on our list one. yeah that's yep. an important one but thank you abby we will do that for sure my last one is from mary and i haven't read the full email yet but there's a point here that she's made which i really like and i'm going to emphasize and matt you should be paying attention so uh mary uh has stated hey y'all i love the podcast and youtube i'm a long time um did you say yeah hey y'all she said hey y'all so I'm, I'm going to, I'm just verbatim, just saying verbatim. Hey, y'all, can I put on an accent here? I don't know where Mary's from. Mary, can I just um, assume uh, this is an American accent? Just so I can say, hey, y'all, uh, I love the podcast and YouTube. I'm a uh, long-time uh, listener and listen to most episodes at least twice. That's awesome. Thank you. Currently in nursing school and just started an accelerated program in January. I'm, uh, I'm really smart, lol. Good job. I'm glad. Uh, and I'm putting the pieces together, obviously tongue in cheek, and I'm putting the pieces together, but I keep coming back to a bit of confusion around pupillary response with the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system stimulation. I understand that sympathetic nervous system causes pupillary dilation, but intuitively I've always imagined that sympathetic nervous system would make the pupils constrict. I mainly think this because the best way for me to remember quickly the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic is that i visualize cocaine as sympathetic nervous system and mushrooms as parasympathetic nervous system ah there's the mistake they they that is not how they work so 
Don't remember it like that. But eyes are not dilated with cocaine use. In fact, they are pinpoint. And on psychedelics, the pupils are like dinner plates. So just remember that the uh, when people take amphetamines, for example, while they are stimulatory, it's not stimulatory just because it's a sympathetic agonist, which it can be, but that's not necessarily the case. There are multiple off-target effects that they can have. So the way I think about it is when you're trying to figure out what the sympathetic parasympathetic does, when you're scared, think about all the things you, your body could do which could benefit your survival in that scared moment. Would your survival be benefited by dilating your pupils so you can see more of your surrounding? Or would it benefit by constricting the pupil to limit what's around you? To focus you? on one thing. Yeah. It would be to see more of what's around you, right? So that's why it would dilate. Same thing with the uh, airways. It dilates the airways as well to get more air in. But when you're resting and relaxing, you don't need dilated pupils. You're sitting there relaxing, reading a book. So you constrict them. So you can focus on what's in front of you. You also don't need to breathe heavily and deeply. So you can constrict the airways as well. So that's the way I like to think about it, Mary. Now, next point. I know this is not a question yet, but I'm like Matthew and it takes me 200 years to make a point. <laughs> I like it. I like that. I was wondering if there could be an episode that really digs deep into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Have we done that? At the same time that it digs into adrenergic and cholinergic receptor sites and also mentions the effects of a few medications and illicit drugs. In ev so we have done adrenergic receptors yeah. and, and cholinergic yeah. receptors. Um, in every course I am in, sympathetic and parasympathetic is important. I'd love to be able to have a synthesis of all the information in one place. And also I think there is a lot of room for interesting asides that only you would know. Stuff from comparative anatomy or medical history. I'd love to hear you um, all talk about this. Even you, Maddie, <laughs> my favorite rambler. <laughs> love it. I love this email, Mary. Uh, I love hearing about fish while I'm trying to cram. Well, this episode's got some fish for you while trying to cram for an exam about human beings. I really do. Best, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Love this email. I hope you're well. Um, we need to double check that cholinergic, adrenergic, those episodes that we did years oh, ago. Almost certain that we've done. Oh, we definitely did one on each. No, quite a lot of them. Um, but maybe they're out of date. Maybe the quality isn't great. Maybe we can merge them into one. So let leave it with Matt and I and we'll have a look. Into, into this one. But thank you so much, Mary. Okay, this is my last one from Claire. Claire says, Hello, I just wanted to say how much I love your podcasts. I was never interested in biology, chemistry, physiology or anatomy at school. These concepts seemed too abstract for someone like me who was interested in social justice, politics and languages. But recently, after finishing a degree 20 years ago and living life, um, I've it's become very important to become a midwife. Cool. So this is where physiology and social justice overlap. True. Great. Okay. And so I've been thrilled to physiology, studying AMP at university, and this is where we come in. Yeah. And so she has requested that she would that we stop podcasting Capital Love an yep. episode an episode on the physiology of childbirth. That's great. We should. We really should. So she's added a few other things in, but that we can kind of tie a lot of those things that she's put in down the bottom of her email yep. in, into that podcast. Awesome. That would be... Uh, who is that from, Matt? That's from Claire. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I agree. We should definitely do an episode on uh, the physiology of childbirth. And that's probably an episode that we should get uh, an expert in. Yes. And I've got a few friends uh, who are in obstetrics, which I think would be able to jump into this episode. So that's awesome. Matthew... Thank you for joining me to talk about the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Did you know... Hopefully you have him back. This afternoon, do you know what I need to do regarding this system? You need to recite it while squatting. 100 kilos, 225 pounds. If you haven't been paying attention, Ninja Nerd, which is Zach Murphy and I, have uh, we're in competition. We've challenged each, each other to the Great Med Ed Challenge. It's actually for fun. Uh, and we're raising money for charity. And we're doing a couple of challenges. The first one was a push-up challenge where we had to recite glycolysis and do push-ups. And you won. I destroyed him. Yes. I absolutely uh, Convincingly. annihilated. How Zach. many did you do? Like 10,000 push-ups. I think I did I think I did 50 push-ups 
while reciting the entire gly- glycolytic pathway. Some people said I cheated with the push-ups. Go on to uh, our YouTube push-ups. channel. Com. Go, go on to our YouTube channel or my Instagram page at Dr. Mark Todorovic to have a look. At Where that you've video. done a video on the physiology of push-ups. Well, I will do. Uh, Agonist, antagonist. Now the next one, next video. Sorry. No, shut your, shut your mouth. So when you're listening to this. Yeah. This. Uh, Turn to the listener or me? Listener. Yeah. By the time you listen to this podcast. It's all done. It's all, already done. So, so you have to go and find it. But that means that... Or maybe you've already seen it. No. Well, this means that they can then look at the second challenge as well, which will be me back squatting 225 pounds or 100 kilos while reciting this RAS I reckon you should have done the deadlift whilst reciting the muscles of the pelvic floor. (laughs) (laughs) As they individually start to uh, give up and then I, uh, yeah, make a mess. All right, Matthew. Thank you so much. Thank you, dear listener. And we'll speak to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Please hit like and subscribe. We've got hundreds of others just like this. If you want to contact us, please do so on social media. We are on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Dr. Mike Todorovic at D-R-M-I-K-E-T-O-D-O-R-O-V-I-C. Speak to you soon.